My dearly beloved in Christ, as we read the lengthy Passion of our Lord today from St. Matthew, and then the rest of this week, Tuesday, the Passion according to St. Mark, Wednesday according to St. Luke, and on Good Friday, the Passion according to St. John, it is very wearying to stand there for 20 minutes or so reading the Passion, but this should remind us of the fatigue and all the sufferings of our Lord during his Passion. Let us especially this week reflect upon the Passion, and when we do so, what do we think of? That which affects us most, that which particularly comes to mind, is the physical pain. The physical suffering, the scourging, the crowning with thorns, being nailed to the cross, etc. That is what especially affects us. But let us also reflect upon the interior desolation of spirit that our Lord felt. Why did he sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane? Because he understood the evil of sin. And he, as it were, took our sins upon himself. And he was weighed down by those sins. So what must have been his grief at the thought of all the sins of mankind from the beginning of the world until now and continuing to the end of time? All of the sins that offend his heavenly Father. What sadness, what sorrow that caused our Lord. What grief of heart and soul. And especially on the cross, it was the will of God that our Lord should feel, as it were, abandoned by his heavenly Father. So much so that he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there are two reasons why our Lord did this. One was to convey to us that desolation of spirit which he experienced, that feeling of being abandoned, although, of course, he did not despair, could not despair, but had that feeling of being left by his father. But he also did so to fulfill the prophecy in Psalm 21, which made up the lengthy tract of today's Mass between the Epistle and Gospel. In Psalm 21 are those words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? David writing centuries before of the coming Messiah and what he would experience. So our Lord said those words to convey to us, again, his interior sorrow and feeling of abandonment, of desolation. So when we meditate on the Passion, Let us not only think of the physical sufferings, but also of the internal or spiritual sufferings, the grief of soul that our Lord experienced. And one more thing I would like to especially reflect upon this morning, and that is the loss of reputation that our Lord experienced. That is something that perhaps we value most of all, our reputation. And when it is challenged, when it is incorrectly described, how quick we are to correct, to want to make right our reputation. And that is just simply a natural response. But look at our Lord, how silent he was throughout his passion. He was crucified between two thieves. And even while he hung on the cross, his enemies were mocking him. And they said, come down from the cross and we will believe. And he kept silent and did nothing. He could have come down from the cross. He could have ended his passion at any time. But he suffered this loss of reputation. He suffered the mockery, the contempt, the ridicule. And what is most marvelous about the Passion is the silence of our Lord. I was reflecting upon that as I was reading the Gospel. When we chant the Passion, there are three voices, three priests or deacons. We'll be doing that this Wednesday for the Mass on Wednesday. And there's the narrator, the chronista. And then there's the priest or deacon who takes the part of all the other voices called the synagogue or synagogue that the priests and Pilate and everyone else. 
And then there is the one who takes the part of Christ, the Christus. And I was just noticing how few times our Lord speaks. So when you chant it, the one who has that part has the easy part, because there are not so many times that he has to sing the words of our Lord. Why? Because Jesus was silent. Here were all his enemies mocking him, challenging him, false witnesses coming forth, and he says nothing. Listen to just a part of the passion that we just read. Now Jesus stood before the procurator, and the procurator asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, Thou sayest it. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Dost thou not hear how many things they prefer against thee? But he did not answer him a single word, so that the procurator wondered exceedingly. Now again, there were a few times our Lord spoke when Pilate directly asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Art thou the son of God? Yes, I am. Thou sayest it. When Caiaphas, the high priest, asked our Lord that question, he commanded him in the name of God to say before the assembled Sanhedrin whether or not he was the Son of God. Then he said it. But other than that, our Lord was silent so often throughout the Passion. What an example for us. How most of the time, better to remain silent than to say something, especially in the face of ridicule or accusations. But it's a very difficult thing to do. Nevertheless, something the saints did, something that the saints learned from our Lord. At the end of April, we celebrate the feast of St. Louis Marie de Montfort, an incredible priest and missionary who was constantly lied about calumniated, and his work undermined as he gave parish missions. And on one occasion, the pastor had given him permission to give a parish mission, and the first evening when it was about to begin, as St. Louis was about to ascend the pulpit, the pastor went out in the sanctuary because the enemies, the Jansenists, had gotten to him with their lies about St. Louis. And he got up and said to the people, I gave this priest, Father de Montfort, permission to give a mission, and now I regret that I did it. I think he's crazy. I think you're wasting your time being here. But I did give him permission, so I will not go back on my word. And then he left. What did St. Louis do? He knelt down in the sanctuary and prayed the Te Deum, which is the prayer of thanksgiving, because of that humiliation, that challenge to his reputation. And it was this type of thing constantly throughout his life. Another example would be of St. Gerard Magella. St. Gerard was accused falsely by a woman of committing a terrible sin. And so shocked were his superiors because they esteemed his virtue. But he didn't answer. He didn't defend himself. So they thought he must be guilty. And they took him to the superior of the Redemptorist order, who was St. Alphonsus Liguori. And St. Alphonsus also believed the calumny because Gerard was not defending himself. And so as a punishment, he forbade him to receive Holy Communion. And if I remember correctly, that was for a period of about six months before that woman finally her conscience bothering her so much, she finally admitted it was all a lie because of her envy of him, jealousy. And so he was exonerated. But imagine the humility to remain silent in the face of that calumny for all of that time. And when his superior asked him, why didn't you defend yourself? He pointed to the rule in which it stated that the religious falsely accused was not to defend himself. And the superior said, well, in this case, that is applying to normal day-to-day -day things. In this case, you should have defended yourself. But we see how the saints acted. And why did they so act? Because of the example of our Lord. 
he was, St. Gerard was a member of the Redemptorist Order. The founder of the Redemptorist Order and the Superior General for many years was St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori. And St. Alphonsus was the victim of jealousy on the part of some of his own religious. And they falsely accused him of something, of mismanaging things, etc. And it ended up being that he was removed by the Pope himself from his office of superior and was even removed from his own order for a period of time. And so we see how the saints were nailed to the cross with Christ. Another example of that is St. Bernard of Clairvaux. St. Bernard was told by the Pope, Pope Eugene, to preach a crusade. The task of traveling throughout Europe in those days was a most difficult enterprise. Besides, Bernard had to win over the German King Conrad because there were a large number of minor wars being waged in Germany at that time. Finally, the Crusaders set out for the East, and Bernard, who had performed his allotted task well, despite the continual sickness which harassed him, felt that he could rest from his labors. But the greatest trial of his life was yet to come. He had preached the cross, but now he was to bear its burden upon his own shoulders. Through no fault of his own, the crusade failed. Thousands of the flower of knighthood perished. Everything, everything was blamed on him and contempt upon Bernard's head. Great saint that he was, he rejoiced that the storm of disapproval and hate was directed against him rather than against the episcopacy or the pope. He was happy to suffer with his master, despised, cursed, followed by the hate of an entire continent. Many other examples of saints, missionaries, could be brought forward. I was even reading of St. Francis Xavier, the greatest of all missionaries, that he was even calumniated, that individuals would write to his superior, St. Ignatius of Loyola in Rome, saying because of his methods, etc., denouncing him. St. Ignatius knew better than to believe those reports. But it is interesting that the saints, while they were alive, were not recognized as saints by those among whom they lived and, and passed their time. They were recognized for their sanctity, especially after their lives. So God permitted them to suffer. And sometimes the denouncing came from good, well-intentioned individuals who really believed this person or that person was doing the wrong thing. So sometimes God even allows virtuous persons to misunderstand another, a fellow religious or a priest or whoever, and to say something untrue. So we all have opportunities, sooner or later, in which somebody says something our reputation perhaps is challenged, and oh, how quick we are to correct the record, to defend ourselves. Try to unite yourself with our Lord, with his silence in his passion, and to bear the affront, the remark, out of patience, with patience, out of love for our divine Lord. Let us reflect upon his admirable silence and his humiliation not only to reflect when we think of the passion of the physical suffering, but the internal suffering, the pain of soul, and also the humiliation, the mockery, the contempt, the ridicule, the being believed to be a criminal by the vast majority. And our Lord endured that for love of us. And he took that, shim that symbol of shame, the cross, and made it the emblem of Christianity, our greatest glory, such that every church is surmounted by a cross, and we have crucifixes in every Catholic home, that we might look at them and reflect upon what Jesus suffered for us to help us carry our crosses for love of him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.